Amira, it doesn't feel like that long ago when I actually bought myself a Canucks t-shirt and we you were did? sitting here watching the right. games in the playoffs here in the studio. It was so exciting. And that wasn't that long ago. And the Canucks uh, have really had some challenges both on and off the ice since then, I guess I would say. And today their team physician, Jim Bovard, came out and said there are now, and, and the, I'm confused, there's either 25 or 26 members of the team. Yeah, I don't know if they've added in Nate Schmidt yet to that uh, to that count, which is a, who is a Canucks defenseman. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a huge struggle. I don't know how they recover from this. It's crazy. I don't know that many people testing positive. They say the source of the infection is confirmed to be a variant, right. which is really alarming. Uh, over twenty one players, three of them from the taxi squad, four members of the coaching staff, an additional players considered a close contact, uh, and they have a contact tracing staff for the club and they're attributing the source infection to a single individual obtained in a community setting uh, so this is scary stuff and it makes me question well is their season over I mean I don't even know how they recover from this so I want to pull in Thomas Drance who's a senior writer covering the Vancouver Canucks for The Athletic Thomas thank you so much for your time today my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. I mean, this is devastating. It seems like every day they're adding another player to the COVID protocol list, which I have to ask you, first of all, what does that even mean? It doesn't mean that they all have COVID. Well, unfortunately, in this case, uh, I believe it does. But the COVID protocol list is uh, players unavailable due to COVID list. The NHL began publishing it shortly after the season began to explain player absences. You know, this is a league that doesn't disclose injuries Generally speaking, the lower and upper body injuries are sort of a hallmark of NHL action. But, you know, you can't have players just disappear in the COVID era without explanation. And so, you know, they they came up with this list and it does cover guys who are quarantining, guys who are high risk, close contacts. But in the case of this outbreak, it is widespread. There's only one high risk, close contact as the team disclosed. Um, You know, there are 22 players now, um, uh, you know, in the in the protocol including the taxi squad players plus the, or sorry, it's 21 plus the three coaching staff members plus a support staffer. Um, so yeah, it's an extraordinarily troubling and widespread outbreak and it poses some really difficult questions for the NHL as a whole. And for us, you know, I think what's important to note is, you know, this is one of the highest profile workplaces in the province, right? This is a group of young, fit athletes and they're sick as a result of this. Uh, additionally, you know, they work in a place with daily testing and a massive PPE budget and strict protocols in place. And, you know, it appears that one of these variants has torn through their workspace in a matter of two days, culminating in, you know, seven straight days in which the club, through their daily testing protocol, has not gone a day without producing an additional positive. So, extraordinarily troubling stuff. It's scary stuff, and there's conflicting reports about the severity of the illness. What are you hearing? Well, you know, the conflicting reports thing is a classic of the experience that people who are infected or positive with COVID-19, you know, undergo, right? There are asymptomatic cases among the Canucks um, personnel, and there are cases where you know, there has been some severer symptoms. That said, you know, there has been no player at any point where the Canucks training staff has been sounding the alarm internally with the idea that perhaps someone needed to go to hospital. Like, that hasn't been the case at any point. But, um, you know, dehydration, vomiting, fevers, chills, uh, you know, even this group of, you know, honestly, a cross-section of the youngest and fittest in our community have been brought low uh, by this illness. Yeah, which is a giant heads up for everyone who thinks, ah, oh, COVID's a hoax, it won't impact me. Right. I mean, what are the odds of the Canucks season just being over? Well, the NHL is committed to that not occurring, right? The NHL is committed to, frankly, I mean, officially, they're committed to playing 56 games, although I think that's extremely unlikely at this juncture, just based on timing and the rate at which the Canucks continue to add positives, frankly, right? Like... Until the Canucks stop producing positives, it's impossible to figure out how they can play within, you know, 10 days of today, for example, Um, you know, until they go about 48 hours without producing an additional positive test. 
Uh, and, and then when that happens, you know, if you, if you accelerate from 10 days from today, um, you're still looking at the club having something like 27 days to play 19 remaining games. That seems like a big ask of completely healthy players, but players on the tail end of, you know, a, an illness that really takes the wind out of your lungs, even in, even in the case of elite athletic performers, um, you know, that just seems, uh, you know, not, not reasonable. Um, and unlikely to me, at least based on my gut instinct. Has it ever happened before in the NHL that a team just ended its season prematurely? Uh, not that I can think of. I mean, you'd probably have to go back to the 1919 Stanley Cup final, um, the last global pandemic when the Cup final was halted because there was a death as the result of the Spanish flu. Um, you know, I, I can't think of an example other than that. Uh, this is a league that even played through World War II. So... You know, it's, uh, it's an extraordinarily rare occurrence. And yet, you know, while the league and the Canucks, I'm sure, will endeavor to do everything they can to get in the full 56 games, it just seems like it's going to be cumbersome to the point of impracticality. And you mentioned the fact that these guys are tested up the yin-yang. There's all kinds of PPE. They do or did seem to have, you know, great protocols to try to protect the players and the staff from COVID. Is it time to start talking about maybe having the NHL go back to the COVID bubble? You know, we'll see. I mean, what's, what's really scary and what I think poses some really difficult questions for the North Division is that, you know, when you look at the players infected, right, the players who've tested positive here, and the fact that only one support staffer has, like it's pretty clear that the source of transmission is unmasked athletic activity on the ice itself right? Mm -hmm. um, if, if the locker room or the meal room or the gym facilities had been the source of transmission, then you would have expected support staffers and injured players uh, to have tested positive at at least a similar rate to what the players on the roster did. But that hasn't been the case. You've only got one uh, of a group of about 15 or 20 of those types of staffers who tested positive versus the majority of coaches and players. So, you know, in a world where in a world where the whatever variant has ripped through this workplace, you know, because in a world where that variant's spreading in Western Canada, uh, it seems that on ice athletic competition, whether it's practice, a morning state, or a game itself, is more dangerous now than it was even four weeks ago. Um, I think that poses some really tricky questions. Like that would be keeping me up at night if I were in the NHL head office or the manager of any Canadian team because it suggests that once COVID or once one of these variants is in your circle at all, if you step on the ice as a team, the risk of transmission and potentially catastrophic transmission, as we've seen in Vancouver, is sky high. Um, whether that suggests that bubbling or getting some kind of risky workplace exemption for you know vaccinations of teams, like I don't know exactly what the answer is, but it does seem that the risk that these seven Canadian NHL teams are taking on for the next eight to ten weeks up until the conference final, um, you know, is certainly elevated from where it has been in the NHL season to this point. Thomas, heads would explode if people found out that the Canucks were going to get priority access to vaccines. Uh, I mean, there's no question about it. And yet, you know, I, I don't know that this is with with the outcome that we've seen in Vancouver, right, which is, um, you know, one one case spreading it to 25 like, I, I just don't know how you look at that and think that it's um, safe over, all around for the athletes participating. Uh, you know, I, it's an extraordinarily difficult issue to work through. Uh, it's not one that I envy the NHL sort of as they administer and, and that the other Canadian NHL teams, and I'm certainly not advocating for, um, you know, NHL or professional athletes jumping the queue here, considering the rates of vaccinations in this country so much as I think it does hold up a mirror to all of us in our community about the elevated risk that we're all sort of living through, uh, especially as a result of the slower rates of vaccination in this country and the prevalence of variants across Western Canada in particular, uh, but you're seeing them in Ontario as well. And, and so I think just a reminder in week 58 of the global pandemic, when most of us have zero appetite to sort of hunker back down, especially as the weather improves, um, you know, that the risk factors in our community are still there and, in fact, arguably might be higher than they have been 
at any point in the pandemic to this juncture. Yeah, you know, you're making a ton of sense there. And it is a game, after all. God forbid if someone actually ended up in the hospital from one of these teams. Thomas Drance, we really appreciate your time today. Thanks for doing this. My absolute pleasure. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thomas Drance is a senior writer covering the Vancouver Canucks for The Athletic. Okay, first of all, I can't see them getting priority access to vaccines. No. No. I can't see people being okay with that. It is a game. I know we like to watch it. I know the NHL, you know, makes a bunch of money and what have you. But maybe it's time to say, all right, the Canucks are out. And maybe it's time to say, if we're not going to go back to the bubble, maybe we put the entire NHL season on ice, keep it fair, shut it down, and then start again next year when hopefully we're vaccinated. Well, this is the worst. This is what everybody was fearing and we talked about when this first started like if this happens this is trouble and it's happening it's it's happening right here in our city which is the saddest part but i'm also thinking of the family members of these players that were exposed like oh my goodness there's kids involved with that so yeah i i I understand there's there's money involved but you economies recover lives don't maybe we should just take a step back and reevaluate and i can't see a lot of the players being at odds with that no yeah you know they're all they're all still getting a paycheck the nhl maybe loses some money in the in, but too you know, bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know what? These guys are not going to be playing at their best anyway if they manage right. to get on the ice. Oh, uh, God. Just- well. All right, pretty much the entire Canucks team has been brought down by COVID. Nobody knows how it's possible that they can play the remaining games. Do you think the Canucks season is just over? What do you think the NHL should do? And what about the idea about hockey players getting priority vaccine access? Yikes, Uh, somebody called in to say, hey, the Americans were almost done vaccinating their population. They could just pony up some vaccines. It'd be no problem. Tina is calling in from Burnaby. You're a big Canucks fan. This is crazy, I've been isn't watching it? watching almost 30 years from the Canucks. Oh, man. Uh, so what do you think? Do you think their season is done? Um, well, you know what? The players have to get healthy. I mean, no one can predict when the players are going to um, get better. I mean, you've you got to put the health first of the players. Hockey's secondary. Absolutely. But I, I also want to comment on your point about the NHL like um, uh, stopping altogether. I mean, how like, my question is, how fair would that be to the other teams that have played uh, almost as many games as the Canucks? Like, I don't see how they could stop the whole league just because of one team getting um, infected. Yeah, you know, fair enough, Tina. And thank you for calling in. I, I guess I'm worried for Alberta because they've got the P1 variant there as oh, well. Yeah. And the uh, the Oilers must be thinking, oh, my God, watching what's going on in Vancouver and well, thinking, please, not here. Well, and think about it, too. Like, I'm, I'm concerned with it. Like, these are elite athletes and the long-term effects of some COVID patients, lung and heart issues, like, that could be career damaging, potentially. I know. I just read a report that looked at 230,000 people with COVID. Yeah. One third of them have brain brain and psychiatric issues, and there is a link to even dementia. I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but But, it's really scary stuff. Mark's calling in from Vancouver. What do you think about what's going on with the Canucks and what happens next, Mark? Hey, hi, everybody. Uh, Big fan of the Canucks, big fan of the show, big fan of Linda Steele. Oh, well, thank you, Mark. uh, I think the Canucks are done for the season. But my only thing I'm thinking is, sure, I mean, proper procedure, proper protocol for COVID and all that stuff. But, I mean, sure, the Canucks get tested every day. But, okay, guys, go on the ice, scrimmage. Okay, hey, you, come over here. You've been tested positive. Come off the ice. Well, you've already been scrimmaging with the guys. I know. I don't know how proper procedure the Canucks have been, even Mm -hmm. though they have lots of money and lots of proper procedures they're saying that they were doing, but I don't buy it. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for calling in and thank you for listening. And it would be very sad to see the Canucks season end that way, but I just want them to be healthy because like you said, these are guys in their 20s. Yeah. You know, I was uh, asking Amir, the top, the oldest player I think is 34. Like probably mid-30s. And yeah. A lot of these guys are just, there's a rookie on the team that's got COVID, so they're just breaking out into their careers uh, now. Yeah, you know? it's uh, we'll keep watching. Yeah. All right. I'm Sarah Ritchie. I'm a reporter for Global News in Halifax. I was working the day everything changed in Nova Scotia last April. My team has spent the last year asking tough questions about how a gunman disguised as a police officer murdered 22 people over 13 hours. On our podcast, 13 Hours Inside the Nova Scotia Massacre, we examine this tragedy hour by hour. We're learning there's a lot more to this story. Listen to all 13 episodes now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts.